Praise the Lord, brethren. To speak to us today is the president of the Dose Fellowship, our sister, the Connest Dr. Pearl Ago. She's a medical doctor, a consultant in community medicine. I want us to put our hands together as we welcome her. She's here already, but we need to welcome her. And she's a dear friend and sister of mine. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the living God. Those fellowship, are you here? Praise the Lord. What of JFI? Are you here? JFI. We are very glad to be here today. This is the first day of our Doves and JFI week. And it promises to be a very exciting and exhilarating and God-glorifying week. And we thank God that once again we are here to celebrate God's faithfulness over the past one year in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank God for the prayers that have been made. And I pray that God will use me to minister to us what he has laid on my heart to do this day. I thank God for Daddy Bishop for <laughs> yielding his pulpit. Uh, let me not say to an unwilling vessel because this year we learned that uh, we should serve the Lord with uh, gladness and joy. But I don't know whether to say I'm a willing vessel. <laughs> I thank God for the opportunity to be used by God to deliver his word to us this day. It really is a privilege. It's not because I'm the most capable or I'm the one that knows the Bible the most. It's just a privilege of God and I'm grateful to him for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Our topic today is developing a godly character. Developing a godly character. That is our topic. Um, a godly character is something that every Christian, not just the those, not just the women, every man, every woman, every boy and girl that is a child of God should strive to develop. It's something that we should focus on. It's not something uh, out there just for the ministers or for the men of God and the ordained. Once you are a Christian, you are a child of God, bearing the imprint of God on the inside. And I dare say, even if you are not, opportunity will be given today at the end of this sermon. An altar call will be made to invite you to give your life to Jesus, to surrender to him who has our life in his hands. Because brethren, you see, at the end of this life... <laughs> Whether you like it or not, there is heaven and there is hell. And what determines where you are going to spend eternity is what you do with what you have heard with his word, whether today or any other day. And time is being given over and over again to men and women. And the message is being preached. Repent. Give your lives to Christ. So that at the end of this life, you will share eternity with our Lord Jesus. So like I said, at the end of this, opportunity will be given for those who want to make sure that Jesus is on the inside. That they have the imprint of the Lord himself in them. And that is the only way you can begin to talk about developing a godly character. Your character determines whom you are. Your character shows whom you, whom you really are on the inside. We will see it on the outside, but it starts from the inside. And it starts with Jesus being inside. You can't fake it. You can't pretend about it. You either have the imprint of God on the inside or you don't. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he keeps on giving us second, third, nay, a million chances to get it right with him. And today he's encouraging us to develop that godly character that he expects people who are made in his own image. The Bible said we are made in the image of God. We have the imprint of God and so we should be we should have a likeness of him. We should have a semblance of him. We should look like him in our character. Those fellowship, God is encouraging us today to set our minds on things that are above and not keep on pursuing this world that has nothing to offer. The worldliness, the decay all around us should not be our focus, should not be our priority, should not be our all-consuming passion. Our all-consuming passion to be should be to arise and be the women that God has called us to be. To arise and be godly women 
So many examples in the Bible, but we're only going to look at one of them today. I'll ask my brother, okay, is he around? If not, then my brother Uche, okay, okay, you're around. We're going to read our text. Our text is taken from 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 17. We're going to look at the life of a woman who had a godly character in the Bible. And as is our custom in this church, we have a covenant with God that when we read his word, in honor of God who gave us his word, we stand for the period we are reading that text. And so I'll encourage us to stand on our feet as we read our text, taken from 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 17. Brother okay. Verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. Verse 9. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand, so it will be, whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Verse 11, and it happened one day that he came there, and he turned in to the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. Verse 13, and he said to him, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. Verse 14. So he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. Verse 15. So he said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. Thank you, Brother K. You may be seated, brethren. I want us to look into our Bibles and look closely at the story of this Shunammite woman. It's a, a, a familiar story for those of us who have been in the church for a while. Our daddy bishop has preached on it a couple of times. Let's look at verse 8. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. This woman was a notable woman. The Amplified called her a rich woman. She was a woman of means. But she didn't flaunt it in front of her husband. I want us to be taking note of the godly character you are seeing in this woman as we proceed. She was living happily with her husband. There was peace in the home or else he wouldn't have agreed to what she said. But she was a woman of means. She had it. But that did not stop her from being submissive to her husband. And then she had a godly husband also. <laughs> that is why I said this topic is not just for the women. Because if she didn't have a godly husband, he wouldn't have agreed to her request. And she encouraged. It was... As often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. She persuaded the man of God to eat some food. She recognized the need that the man of God had for food and offered herself to minister to his need. Offered her home, her food. And it didn't just end, the end there. She went to her husband and said, look, 
I know this is a man of God. Instead of us to just be giving him food as he's passing, whenever he passes by, he rushes in and eats and rushes back to where he's coming from. Why don't we prepare a room for him in the attic or in the upper room? And put the basics there so that at least he can have a place to lay his head. He can rest. And he did that because the Bible tells us, and it happened in verse 11, one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. So the husband agreed and they gave him that upper room and he had a place to lay his head. She was not the only woman that saw the need of this servant of God, Elisha. I'm sure she wasn't. But she was the one that allowed God to use her to respond to the need that she saw in his life. And I thank God for her husband who allowed her to express herself. And follow the leading that God put in her heart and not muzzle her with one thing or the other. We have so many godly husbands in this church. My husband, starting with them all. <laughs> I didn't say he's the most godly. Our daddy bishop is there. But I know my testimony will come later. Let me just continue with the text. She told her husband, let us prepare a room for him. So that not only will he have food to eat, he will have a place to lay his head. And Matthew, he wasn't alone. He moved with his servant, Gehazi. Because in verse 12, he said, Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, as he was lying down in the upper room. So she had to provide for both of them. And we know our daddy bishop, usually we are used to that. When he moves, he moves with his ADCs. All gathered here, some of them. But she wasn't the only one who saw the need. But she allowed God to use her. We can see giving in her character. We can see hospitality. We can see kindness. We can see love. We can see care for the servant of God. In fact, they appreciated it so much that the servant of God said in verse 12, Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite woman. And when he had called her, she stood before him. See her meekness. See her obedience. See her reverence. She didn't say, Because I'm housing the servant of God, I can come anyhow in his presence. She stood before him, my Lord. And he said to him, Say now to her, look, you have been concerned with us. You have been concerned for us with all this care. And the Amplified says, most painstakingly and reverently concerned for us. She went out of her way to care, of the servant of, to care for the servant of God and his servant. And she didn't do it because of what she would gain. She had no ulterior motive. Why do I say that? If we go on, he says, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander or to the army? Do I talk to the president on your behalf? Can I meet this minister? Can I go to this person to give you a contract? To give you a job? To give you an appointment because of this thing you have done for me? Do you want me to pray for you for anything? Are you doing it because of a prophetic pronouncement you expect the man of God to make on your behalf because we have ministered to him? Let's see what she replied. And she answered, I dwell among my own people. She was sufficient in herself. If you read this and stop here, you will never know she had a need. But the Bible didn't stop here. She said, I dwell among my own people. I am comfortable in my own skin. I'm okay. I'm not doing this because of anything I want from you, oh man of God. I'm not doing this because of a contract I expect. I'm not doing this because of a job. I don't know if I was the one whether I would have answered that way. I have a long list of prayer points. And I know that this man of God here, he said, hey, God answers him. He entered into a covenant with God at the beginning of this church. That there is no prayer that will come his way. That God, that God will bring his way that God will not answer. And we have seen him answer prayers. We have seen God answer his prayers time and time again. My sister Chinelo and my friend has already dwelt on the 29 years of God answering our prayer. The covenant that he entered into with his servant, our daddy bishop. Not one woman has been lost on account of childbirth because of the covenant that God entered into. He entered into that covenant with God that I will not look for any of my women as they enter the labor ward and come out. And I think Chinelo called this the favor, favor word <laughs> in amazing love. We are favored. And so having this kind of servant of God, 
Do you think I will say, hey, I'm okay? No way. I will bring my husband's prayer list, which is plenty. The one, should I mention the names of the people who are owing him? I think I'm on, the, I'm on the altar. Let me leave their names. But I know those who are owing him. I will bring their names. I know the projects he has that I'm expecting to come to fruition. I will bring that one. When I finish with my husband's own, then I will bring my own. My career is there. My, that is, what of my children? Those who are looking for school fees, they, they say that the dollar has gone or is it up or down? I don't know. There's so much on my prayer list. Oh, man of God. How discerning of you to know that there's something I need. This woman did not do that. She was doing what she was doing just for goodness sake. Because she had the character of God inside. Because she had the imprint of the master. She was a godly woman. And just doing what she needed to do. She identified the need and was meeting it. And if the Bible, if this servant of God did not go ahead, to, if the Gehazi did not go ahead to say, oh, look at what she needs. <laughs> I don't think she would have said anything. Let's go on with our story. And Gehazi answered, verse 14. So he said, that is Elisha now, what then is to be done for her? What then can we do for this woman who has done all these things? And Gehazi answered, not the woman answered. She left her need. She did not allow her need to obstruct or stop the service of God that she was offering. She did not even mention it. It, it, it did not show on her face, brethren. Because if it showed on her face, they would have said, oh, Elisha may have said, what is making this woman so sad? And why is her countenance falling? You could not tell from her face what she was going through. Verse 14, so he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. That to me is a very great need. Not just that she has no son, but the person who will help her and get the son is very old. They told you I'm a medical doctor, so I understand the implication. Please, men, uh, I'm not saying that if you are very old, you cannot have a child. Is that what I said? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying I understand the medical implications of somebody who has no son and her husband is old. And in the culture in which they were in, Shunem is part of Israel. If you go to your uh, Bible college uh, uh, notes and geography, you will see that it's at the base of the hill of Moreh in the valley of Jezreel and all that. It's part of Israel. So part of their culture as Israelites, they needed to have a son. They placed a lot of importance on sons. So it was a great need. But she didn't mention it. She was just doing what the Lord had told her to do. And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. Verse 15, so he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Look at the humility of this woman. She didn't rush into the man of God's room and pounce on his bed or just take any position. She stood in the doorway waiting for the next step. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Eliza had told her. God met her unexpressed need. She did not allow her need to be cloud what she was doing. But God, who knows? Do you believe that God knows your need? The Bible tells us ever before we call that he has answered. He does not want us to focus on those needs. No way. That's not what he's sending me to tell us today. He wants us to focus on developing a godly character. On making sure that if we bear the name of the Lord Jesus, if we say we are Christians and we have the imprint of God in us, then for heaven's sake, let's begin to show forth that character that represents whom God is. Let's begin to arise and do things in the house of God without being told, without waiting for your president to delegate you to do something. Without, let's go beyond the duty. You have been given an usher's badge. You are an intercessor. You are whatever you are in the house of God. And that is all. Even to do that one is a problem. Let's go beyond the call of duty and begin to identify needs as God opens our eyes. When we have godly characters, brethren, it will give us discernment. We'll be able to see issues that need to be tackled. We'll be able to intervene. 
We'll be able to go to the man of God and say, because, by the way, we need to seek counsel as we do some of these things I'm encouraging us or God is encouraging us to do today. So that we don't um, fall into the trap of fostering rebellious spirits in the house of God. And some of us, some people in the past have fallen into that trap. The only time they will see they want to help somebody is people at the time that the church is raising questions. The church has placed them on probation or the, the church is raising questions about them and we are trying to work with them spiritually. And that's the only time you see to come and shower gifts on this person. No, you're not helping the person. You're not helping the person. You're actually stalling the person's spiritual growth with your physical gifts. So that's not what I'm talking about. And remember at the beginning of this year, we were told to seek counsel in all things, big and small. So even as we identify this need, the man of God is there. His servants are there. Seek counsel to know the one you need to intervene in and the one the Holy Spirit is saying, leave this person, let him hunger so that he will learn a thing or two from me. And in the words of Oswald Chambers, we run in and play amateur providence and not know we're actually killing that person. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, about people who... Look, in this church, we have so many examples. Recently, we were told of two youngsters who, I will not mention their names, who identified a need in their pastor's house and in their own way. Youngsters tried to meet it. They saw a gap. See, this thing shouldn't be. What can I do to help? We heard of people in the last retreat who on their own came out and subsidized the food that we were eating and others just didn't see, he didn't even ask. It didn't even occur to us to even ask how is this food being provided? We've heard of people who have flooded the car park, identified that need and came to the man of God and said, I want to do this. Can I go ahead? We've seen people who have tiled the toilet floors. We've seen people who have swept the church. We've seen people who were weeding the car, the car park before it was flooded. It's not about money, brethren. Everything is not money. It's about identifying what needs to be done in the house of God. That's one way of developing a godly character. And making sure that your own personal need does not be cloud what God is leading you to do. I know in this church many years ago, God met a need for the women using our daddy bishop. He saw women who were going in and out of the labor ward and they come out with their children and they had no mothers. Yes, you tell me what about those ab abroad who don't have anybody. We are here. We are not abroad. Some of them, their mothers were dead. Some, their mothers were too old to come from the village to help them and they had no female relations to help them in those critical first two or three weeks to bath the baby, take care of themselves, having just delivered. And the man of God saw that need and called us in the Dose Fellowship and said, I want us to do something about this. And that was the origin of how we started bathing babies and mothers in this church. To the extent that even when their mothers are around, we tell them, please, give us gap. <laughs> Sisters, am I not telling the truth? Give us back gap. I know you are the biological mother. Give us gap. Let's finish our own. It was a need that the man of God saw and stepped in to meet. Developing a godly character like we learned in the David Generation Week last year. It will determine our carrying capacity for true prosperity. We all still have the notebooks that has, it, that has that imprinted on it. That's not the only thing a godly character will do. To give us discernment. It will make us fruitful in the house of God. It will remove our eyes from the things in this world and set our mind on things above. So that we begin to think like God. Brethren, there is no more time. We may think we have all the time in the world to make amends. Last Sunday, we heard a message about squandering divine opportunities. And God may be bringing your way and mine countless divine opportunities to develop our godly character. And we are sweeping it away. I'm encouraging us to make sure we take heed. As for myself, like I was trying to say earlier, when I left Lagos, which is where I grew up with my parents, when I became born again, I, I was attending a living church. And God gave me so many opportunities to express myself and to develop the godly character, which I'm still, by the way, developing. I've not arrived. And when I came down to Enugu, I said, oh, these people's dry, 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 dry looking states, even though I'm from Enugu. 
I'm from Enugu State too. But I just looked at the small bacha and said, oh my, what, what am I going to do here? How am I going to express myself here? But I thank God because that small bacha has blossomed into this beautiful praise temple. And it's not about being a small bacha or being a big praise temple. You can express yourself wherever you find yourself. I was just being stupid. And God opened my eyes and showed me and is still showing me many areas where I could develop that character and emulate this woman and many other godly women examples we have in the Bible. Things I needed to do without being told. Areas I needed to step in. I'm not saying it's easy. But what has made it a lot easier is having a godly husband like the one I have. Who has helped me at every step of the way. He saw me in Lagos and saw how I was in my church and assured me from day one I will never stand in the way of whatever God is leading you to do. I will encourage you. I will support you. And he has been doing just that. And I want to thank God for him and many other godly husbands we have in this church. It doesn't mean that the husbands are laid back and not do They have their own things God is telling them to do. They are also very active in the house of God. But they realize that these are wives have things that God is calling them to do. Let's support them in whatever way we can. Not to talk of the kids. They've all been very supportive. What am I saying, brethren? I'm just exhorting us. This is just an exhortation. Let's arise. Let's arise and be the men and women, boys and girls that God is calling us to be. Let's set our minds on things that are above. Let's develop that character that will distinguish us as belonging to God. So we don't have to be guessing. Mm, is she a child of God? Mm, is she not? There's something that was read for us in the night vigil. This Friday by the Conayo when he prayed for the women. And brother Uche, brother, okay, I would like us to please read it again. Second, you don't have to stand up this time. It's not our text. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 5 to 9. Verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, to self control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Verse 8, for if these things are yours and are bound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Thank you, Brother K. Let us pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer, brethren. Developing a godly character starts with being born again. You can't give what you don't have. And in the book of Colossians chapter 3, we are encouraged to put off the old man and put on the new one, which is who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The only way and the first step of putting on that new man is to make sure that you give your life to Christ. Christ.